player profiler posse. I am Hilo, and this is First Mover. We are back. Show number four. And I posted a poll on Twitter to kind of get an idea of if we were going to continue this uh, exploration into human psychology at play in best ball or with the first full week of the preseason, if we were going to transition to kind of what we were doing or what we we're going to do once the regular season hits. And that's take a look at DFS and a first look for the week. And hands down, the poll winner was to continue our exploration into human psychology in best ball. So that is what we're going to do today. We're going to continue this journey of human psychology and best ball. And specifically today, we're going to talk about some practical psychology and best ball, primarily focusing on ADP. Before we get into that discussion and speaking of ADP, here's a quick word from the Podfather himself about the world famous player profiler draft kit. Hey, it's the Podfather of great news. The 2023 draft kit is live. It is world famous. Why? Because it is the best resource for winning fantasy football championships that exists. There are rankings and cheat sheets for every format you can imagine. We have projections both at the team level and the player level. And wherever you are, you can click on a player, open them up and see in-depth written analysis about what to expect in fantasy football from that player this year. And then you can click on the team and you can get even more in-depth analysis, all the drivers of fantasy production, both in a positive and negative direction for that team, including a signature trend. And the graphics are incredible. So these team insights, they give you the team level projections, the vacated targets, the vacated areas, and that one dynamic for each team that you need to know when making decisions on draft day. And we added a bunch of features. I mean, individual cheat sheets for Theo and Billy and Dario. So you could take your favorite analyst and download their personal draft cheat sheet. And then in the commissioner's section, also brand new this year, Memphis Young lays out everything you need to know to manage a league, do's, don'ts, tips, and what the more innovative fantasy commissioners are doing this year. That's presented by Trophy Smack. The whole package is presented by the Fantasy Football Players Championship, the FFPC, Ray Garvin, Derek Brown, the best minds in the industry contributing analysis. It's certainly not the most inexpensive draft kit on the market, but uh, <laughs> it is the best. Playerprofiler.com slash draft kit. Playerprofiler.com slash draft kit. Go get it. Welcome back. So this idea of ADP, what is ADP? How do we leverage it? How do we exploit it? How do we handle ADP? What's going on behind the scenes with ADP? And what, what are the human psychology aspects at play in ADP, which we can generally assume or view it as this governing construct through which we play the game of best ball? I think my good friend and Badge Bros member, John Warner, if you're not following John, go give him a follow. If you're not looking at the, or watching their content over at the Badge Bros and you're playing best ball, probably doing it wrong. Those guys are pumping out some great content, and so check them out. But John Warner put out a tweet probably about seven to ten days ago now, and he said... ADP is to underdog as salary and ownership are to DFS. On the surface, this quote just kind of looks like some guy like shouting into the wind. But when we dig this, when we dig deeper into what he's actually saying through this analogy, these he's describing the governing constructs by which we play each of those games. In DFS, we are obviously governed by a salary cap of 50K. And we are primarily concerned with ownership because that is our way of exploiting the field, of leveraging um, the field, and of basically reducing the number of people that we have to be in order to win a given week. Well, in best ball, really the only construct that we have that is governing our decisions that is 
tailoring our game plan development and our process is ADP. So how do we exploit salary and ownership in DFS? We're thinking about unique combinations. We're thinking about roster construction tendencies. We're thinking about doing things that the field is not on a given week to, again, reduce the amount of the field that we're competing against for first place, because that is where all the money is. So along the same lines of thinking, how can we exploit ADP in best ball? We have to first take observations because observations go into our game plan development because without that, we have to then make assumptions that are not based on any concrete evidence. And when we talk about game theory and human psychology and the things that we've been discussing up to this point, that is an extremely important aspect of our game plan development because we are able to tailor our hypotheses, which again, that's all game theory is, is we're making hypotheses. And then we go back and we double check those hypotheses. We tweak them and we test them. Well, without those field observations, we have to make assumptions on the field, which are going to be less accurate. So these observations on the field are extremely important to our starting point for our game plan development when we're looking to you know, apply this to any game, apply this to driving to work. Game theory is generally thought of as it pertains to legitimate games, so competing agents or players, but it is something that is utilized to analyze economics, um, traffic. So if you take this example and boil it down, think about driving to work. If you and your spouse or your significant other are both working at the same, and stick with me here, this is, I'm just trying to relay this as, as clearly as I can. Say that you bo both live in the same domicile and you work at the same place, but for whatever reason, you must take separate cars to work. And you're thinking through, how can I optimally get to work? What kind of observations and, and we'll say field tendencies of, of the other drivers that are on the road are we using to make those decisions? Well, nowadays we have things like GPS, we have things like uh, the news. But back in the day where it was like, we just kind of knew how to drive around streets before GPS and before all these things, we had to kind of take assumptions based on our previous routes to work. What is the optimal path for me to take to get to work? What's well, the same thing in a game where you're applying game theory is you must incorporate these observations of the field, which tailor your decision-making process, your game plan development, and how you go about trying to maximize and optimize for that game. So in this game of best ball and the constructs that we have here, the observations of the field, again, become very important. And what we have seen over the four iterations or five iterations if we go back to pre-underdog days for best ball specifically is that the field places an extreme emphasis or a primary focus on exploiting ADP by generating what we call closing line value versus ADP. That is simply where do I draft a player and how does that compare to where his ADP ends when the contests close for drafting? So that is a, a generalized thought process that comes over from sports wagering, closing line value, take it at, you know, as we know, action is going to bias lines. It's going to move lines throughout the week. So what we're trying to do early in the week is maximize our closing line value for the close of the line later in the week. So that same thought process applies to best ball. Can I, it's a similar concept in DFS saying we'll relate it to everybody has 50,000 in salary to operate with on a given week. What if there were things that we could do to make it so that you had 55,000 salary or 60,000 salary? Are there opportunities to exploit the field through generating closing line value. 
in DFS, those types of situations present themselves through cheap running backs. A lot of stuff that we're going to talk about as we get into the season when we're talking more DFS. But in the game of best ball, this is the primary focus of the field as it relates to ADP. How can I generate closing line value versus ADP and build lineups that others are unlikely to be able to build because I'm drafting a lot of players past ADP, I'm getting three third rounders on a roster, whatever the case may be. That is the primary focus of the field that we've seen over the last couple of seasons. So I've said, I've mentioned the term exploit or exploitation a couple of times. I want to quickly define what that means. An exploitation is simply a deviation away from optimal theory designed to take advantage of some of these observed tendencies from the field. We'll relate that now to poker. Over the previous eight to 10 years, we've started to see this new, this new process in poker called Game Theory Optimal, which is we have solvers, we have um, different tools, different computing tools that have worked out different situations based on previous action, based on own holdings, based on bet sizing, based on all the things. They've gone, they've worked it all out, and they have spit out frequencies for your optimal action. Say your post-flop, flops come out, and... Pre-flop, the action went limp, raise, call. Now we're at the flop. We know the previous action, and we see a donk lead. So the under-the-gun player, for example, leads and bets into you in position. You've flopped top, top pair, top kicker. You're holding ace-king with a very, very dry king high board. What is the optimal action at this point? Is it to raise every single time? Is it to slow play every single time? No. The solver is going to spit out a frequency from basically that you are going to optimize against the generalized field. The assumption there is that your opponent is also playing game theory optimal. We know that humans are not computers. We know that humans are not able to possess that processing power to know the optimal action in every given situation based on the previous action or the pre-flop action, and et cetera, et cetera. So exploitations are plays that are designed to maximize your expected value against inefficiencies from the field. So again, how can we exploit ADP in best ball? If we know that we have things that are proven to be optimal in theory, such as week 17 correlation, such as roster construction, such as maximizing your advancement rate. And those are important because the two primary contributors to expected value in these best ball contests are advancement rate and are optimizing a roster for week 17 because those are based on the payout structure the highest contributor to your actual value, which is realizing expected value. And before we continue, realizing, or I guess I should say, we must first understand what expected value is and how it is calculated. Expected value, again, is the amount of money that we can expect to extract from each entry in these contests. First of all, we are fighting against rake in these contests, which is going to lower our expected value per entry right off the bat. Second, because of the top-heavy nature of the payouts in these contests, we know that week 17 is extremely important. And if you break down the amount of money that is paid to each position or each round that you advance in best ball contests, Week 17 is the primary contributor to expected value. The second highest contributor to expected value in these contests is pass-through rate. So getting out of your draft. So placing top two out of the 12 people in your draft. Weeks 15 and weeks 16 
are very, very minimal contributors to expected value. That should tailor our thought process. And that should tailor our game plan development and how we are looking to attack these contests. So all of that, the math behind it, and the theory agree that we need to be optimizing for week 17 through things like correlation, through team stacks, and we need to be focused on getting out of our draft and advancing because that's how we are going to make money, and that is step number one. The final consideration to the discussion on expected value is that we have to realize the first assumption of expected value is that these contests are able to be simulated on an infinite timeline. We have to realize that that makes expected value very, very different from realized or actual value. That also gives us leeway or additional rope to be able to make these exploits against field tendencies. If we could simulate this season on an infinite timeline, we would want to stick exactly to game theory optimal as it would be in poker. Or in best ball, we could just say optimal theory. The problem is one, we don't have the same computing power in this game because it is so new. I mean, look at poker. It took 60 years since Texas Hold'em really started taking hold for that computing power to be realized. We are in year six, maybe, of best ball, depending on how you view the pre-underdog um, market. And our sample size for best ball is one. This season is our sample size, and we have one iteration of it. So we don't have an infinite iteration of it. So right off the bat, we should be game planning to make exploits against the field based on our exploration or the, the actual understanding of what expected value is. So those two things kind of combine to give us the leeway to make these exploits against the field. I don't know what theoretical optimal roster construction is in these contests. On Underdog last year, I theorized that optimal roster construction, again, assuming we could simulate the iteration of that season on an infinite timeline, was very likely to be no more than three running backs, most likely one quarterback, and most likely one tight end. I'm not going to get into what led me to theorize that that was theoretical optimal. Um, I've done that previously. If you want to check those out, head on over to oneweekseason.com. Check out the Best Ball Plus product. We ran a promotional product the last season, and those are found in that. Those are archived. But head on over to oneweekseason.com. Check out the Best Ball Plus product again. Um, Mike Johnson and myself, we are pumping out five one-on-one -on -one training sessions a week um, from the day after the NFL draft until the start of the NFL season. So that is 90 one-on-one -on -one training sessions. Price was just lowered to 99 bucks. So 90 one-on-one -on -one training sessions for a hundred bucks. Go check it out. Head on over to oneweekseason.com. Click on the Best Ball Plus product. Use promo code HILO. H-I-L-O-W, that'll get you another 20% off. So go check that out. Back to this discussion of ADP and exploiting field tendencies through our field observations. What we see a lot from the field is, well, let's back up a bit. We have to realize also that ADP is fluid. ADP is going to change. And what we, how I typically like to think about ADP is it's going, to, it's going to shift and it's going to be a sliding scale. And what I mean by that is there are some players that are going to see extremely large deviations in their ADP. Your holdouts, your preseason injuries, your players coming off injuries, your players who early in the draft season weren't signed, Jarek McKinnon your players who are on offenses that were being undervalued by the field to begin with, 
Um, the Los Angeles Rams was a good example. Van Jefferson, uh, these players that have extreme movements in ADP. The flip side to that is players that have a very, very narrow band of ADP movements throughout that draft cycle. But how do we incorporate those ADP movements into our decision-making processes when we are in a snapshot of time within that overall draft cycle? So I broke down, and this is, again, just me theorizing. I wanted to capture snapshots in ADP movement and tailor my decision-making process in a best ball draft based on those snapshots in time. Because while we are going to see major movements in ADP, while we are going to see more narrow uh, banded ADP movements, all of the macro picture of those movements, they all interact. One player cannot jump up in ADP without affecting the others around him. So it's not enough to simply compare where a player's ADP was when we started, when these contests opened the day after the NFL draft in late May to where they are now, where we project them to be come September 7th. That's not enough because that is, I call it the soda straw effect. That is looking at trying to get a landscape view of a beautiful countryside through a soda straw. You're only going to see a very, very minute part of that entire picture, that entire landscape. It's the same thing for looking at ADP movements through a very, very narrow lens like that. We don't, we're not capturing the whole picture of how the rest of the market has been affected by those ADP movements. What we typically see from the field is a lot of players are going to effectively be removing players from their player pool that have experienced those massive ADP movements. Let's take Joe Mixon, for example. Joe Mixon started this draft cycle, and we'll define that. Draft cycle I define as from when the contest opens to when the contest closes. Everything that is happens in between, that is part of the overall draft cycle. Joe Mixon started this draft cycle, so the day after these the NFL draft, when these contests launched, most of them, we'll say, there were some that launched a couple weeks after that. Joe Mixon started with a middle-of-the-seventh round ADP in the mid low to mid-80s. He is now in the around the 4-5 turn. So a generalized assumption is that we can assume that some of the field is eliminating Joe Mixon from their player pool because he has experienced such a drastic movement. We used a couple examples earlier, players who were not signed. Jarek McKinnon was a good example. When these contests opened, Jarek McKinnon was not a member of the Kansas City Chiefs. He was available in the 18th to 20th rounds of drafts. Now he's in the 11th to 12th round. Are we not targeting Jarek McKinnon? Are there ways that we can do it smartly to leverage, even though he has experienced that significant of ADP movement? We mentioned another one in Van Jefferson. Van Jefferson was on or is on an offense that was being extremely undervalued by the field to begin. He was available. He was going undrafted or in the 18th to 20th round when these contests opened. Similar to Jarek McKinnon, he's up in the 12th, 13th round now. Is that a player we should have zero exposure to from now on until the end of the draft cycle? So for the next four weeks? That's one way to handle it. That's a way, the primary way I think the field is handling it. So realizing that every other player is moving ADP with these major movers, with these major fallers, I wanted to accurately capture more narrow snapshots in time to feed into our starting point for our game plan development in these contests. And I based it on the amount of information that is available, and that's more or less strictly tied to time. 
what I did is I broke it up into the overall draft cycle. So when we can draft rosters in these contests into three distinct draft windows, the first window was from the opening of the contest until the start of preseason camp. So we just left that window. Why is that? That's a larger chunk of time when we compare it to these next two windows that I'm going to discuss. But in that draft window, we had very, very little news or new news or actionable information that we can feed into our decision-making process. We didn't know a lot of depth camp battles. We didn't know health on a lot of players, the players coming off injuries, new injuries that were going to occur. We had very, very little information. Draft window two is from the start of preseason camp until the start of the preseason, which we are now coming up on and we are smack dab in the middle of that draft window. So compare the timeline of those two. Draft window one is about six weeks long. Draft window two is about two weeks long. And now draft window three is from the start of preseason. So this coming weekend until the start of the NFL season. You'll see that information is on a sliding scale during those distinct draft windows. You'll see that obviously time, we're getting closer. But the primary function of doing that is it captures snapshots in time of expected ADP movements. For about three weeks prior to the start of preseason camp, all you could see on Twitter was, oh my God, ADP is not moving, or this is su such a static environment, or all these kind of references to exactly what I was trying to capture in that snapshot in time. Now, once preseason camp started, we had all this information, fire hose of information thrown at us all at once. That information is going to affect the crowd psychology of the field which is then moving these ADPs. And if we think about how ADP is initially started or set in these contests, ADP is initially set based on median projections for individual players around the league. It moves by primarily two functions. The first is changing player project median projections. So guys like Van Jefferson, guys like Jarek McKinnon, guys that are affected by injury. And it also changes drastically based on this psychological aspect of crowd psychology, of individual psychology that we've discussed previously. And then you start to see overreactions in both directions. You start to see players that are moving too high past their median projection. You start to see people, players that are moving too low beyond their median projection. So there is a semblance of leverage that can be invoked and exploited based on those ADP movements in a vacuum. But we're going to focus on the aspects of how the field is looking to exploit ADP and things that we can do differently against that. So we covered that earlier. The field is primarily looking to exploit ADP by generating closing line value versus ADP. And while that is good, that is a good way to exploit ADP in this contest. It is not the only way. But generalized statement here, generalized statement alert, it is the only way that the field is exploiting ADP in today's current environment. That leads to some of the things that I've posted on Twitter about not being tied to ADP and realize the caveat with this is that we do have to be cognizant of the overall shifting environment of ADP, where it was, where we can project it to go, and how do we exploit that range. So if the field is only, again, generalized statement, there are players who are going beyond this in the field, but from a generalized observation of the field, the field is only looking to exploit ADP by generating the closing line value. So that is fallers past ADP, and that is the primary focus. I propose and theorize and hypothesize that we can generate 
exploitations versus ADP, again, based on those field observations, in another way. We can reach. Oh my God, I was saying go reach for players. What is he talking about? This has to be done in a very nuanced way because through an exploit, exploit of the field, an exploitation, remember, an exploitation is a deviation away from optimal theory. That action in and of itself, mathematically, is a hit or a decrease to expected value. It's the same thing in poker. We might choose to make a play that is not optimal in theory that is designed to exploit the field. Well, if it is not optimal in theory, how can that increase expected value if we know that the exploitation away from optimal theory is going to hinder our expected value? The exploitation must generate a higher boost to expected value than the decrease from the exploit itself. And that is very, very important. We can't just be reaching at any point in the draft because Hilo said to reach in the draft to generate leverage based on an exploit. It has to be done in a nuanced fashion. We have to kind of understand the overall macro picture of ADP movements, where players started, where we can expect or project them to go, generalized assumptions of the field, what they are doing, what they are not doing. And that kind of all ties into our decision-making process for each decision node, which a decision node in a best ball draft is simply a draft pick. If we consistently make these exploitations that are designed to generate more expected value than the loss on expected value from the deviation itself, that adds up throughout an entire portfolio. Portfolio for us is just all the best ball drafts that we are planned to draft for this season. And that is also an important distinction because the number of drafts that we plan to draft this year might be very, very different from the number of drafts that we have drafted up to this point. This is a very, very dynamic strategy, dynamic draft strategy. We are not drafting the same in each of those draft windows that I alluded to earlier. There are different ways to generate leverage or generate expected value versus field exploits in each of those individual windows. We're not going to get into those in this episode. Again, go check out One Week Season. We've covered them in depth there. But we will say, I will give you my generalized game plan for where I am looking to reach in drafts to exploit these field tendencies that we've seen. The assumption that I started with that based these theoretical hypotheses was that Players in the first three rounds of ADP all have overlapping single game ranges of outcomes. Obviously, there are going to be players that have higher per game ceilings, primarily your tier one players, your Justin Jefferson, your Jamar Chases, your Tyreek Hills, your Cooper Cup, your um, Travis Kelsey and your CMC and Austin Eckler. Like that is your tier one. Those are your tier one players. Their single game ranges of outcomes are far greater um, as far as ceiling goes than the other players in the first three rounds. Beyond those guys, we start to see significant overlap in single game range of outcomes. And Hila, why is single game range of outcomes important? It's important because this game that we are playing, best ball, emphasizes ceiling in a range of outcomes because the computer is generating our lineup and oh by the way this is a very very under thought of construct of these contests is these are playoff contests the first 14 weeks are cumulative scoring that is the portion of the contest where things like roster construction um, boost our expected value because they will boost our advancement rate. But when we start talking about single week ranges of outcomes and single week areas of these contests, 
weeks 15, week 16, and week 17. That is where this idea of single week range of outcomes takes on an elevated meaning and an elevated um, addition to expected value calculations. So with that in mind, we can assume that outside of those tier one players, players in the first three rounds have significant overlap in their single game ranges of outcomes. If that is the case, why are we so tied to ADP beyond tier one? Why do I care what my two, three turn or my, my second, my third round picks are within that range? We know in, in round one, we're prioritizing tier one players, but beyond that, if there is significant overlap, why are we simply tied to ADP and looking to generate leverage against the field by only catching fallers? We should be looking to mix up those pairings as much as possible. Think about in DFS. How are we leveraging generalized field tendencies versus ownership and salary? We're looking to generate unique combinations. We're looking to lower the amount of field that we are fighting against on our way to first place. Same thing in best ball. Let's take an example. Let's take Amon Ross St. Brown. Amon Ross St. Brown started in the late second round, and he's now going at the one-two turn. That gives a very, very narrow... Well, he started in the middle second round. Now he's going at the one-two turn. That gives a very, very narrow band of players that he has most likely been paired with in the first two rounds. The most common is C.D. Lamb. But who also, and, and that's for good reason, because that's a week 17 correlation. We know that that is important. Yada, yada, the list goes on. That is a, a field tendency based on proper actions. But what we have not seen a lot of are Amon Ross St. Brown with Tony Pollard. Same thing, where it's the same week 17 correlation. Roster construction, all that is good. We're in round two. But Tony Pollard has basically mirrored Amon Ross St. Brown's movements up in ADP throughout this draft cycle. So that has made that pairing within the first three rounds very, very low owned up to this point. It feels gross right now because you have to take Amon Ross St. Brown in the first round. And that feels weird because people were drafting him in the middle to late second round for the past six weeks. So how does that generate enough boost to expected value to offset the deviation or the exploitation away from optimal theory? Do we know sitting here that CD Lamb plus Amon Ross St. Brown is going to be the optimal player stack from that week 17 matchup? No. I mean, based on who Detroit is as a defense, I would put the odds of Tony Pollard being the highest scoring Dallas player in week 17 at at least even money versus CD Lamb. Yet that pairing, again, which is influenced by by week 17 correlation, similar to C.D. Lamb and Amon Ra, is very, very low owned. So that is something that I want to be extremely overweight. And it doesn't take a ton to be overweight when you talk about an entire portfolio if the field is utilizing it at a very, very low frequency. Another example, and this one should be a little bit easier to visualize, is Travis Kelsey and Patrick Mahomes. What is it? Between probably just based on observations, between 40 and 60% of all Travis Kelsey teams are going to have Patrick Mahomes. While that player stack does reduce the amount of variables that need to go right in order for that stack to succeed, think about in DFS terms. If Travis Kelsey were 40% owned on a DFS slate, 
one, would Patrick Mahomes also be 40% owned? I guess the, that math is off. If if Patrick Mahomes were 40% and or if if Travis Kelsey were 40% owned, based on that math, we should expect Patrick Mahomes to be about 20% owned. Is that kind of what we're seeing in best ball? Yeah. So how do we exploit that in DFS? How would we leverage that if we broke open expected ownership on Saturday evening and we saw Travis Kelsey's 40%, Patrick Mahomes is 20%. We would probably look to be building a little bit differently than the field in that given week. Does that mean we have to fade Travis Kelsey on that week? No. Does that mean I'm probably, if I'm playing Travis Kelsey, playing him without Patrick Mahomes? Probably. Does that mean I can maybe find a way to add an underowned pass catcher from that game correlation? Probably. It's the same thing in best ball. If the generalized field, if the generalized field is utilizing Patrick Mahomes on 50% of the rosters that have Travis Kelsey, I want to be trying to do something a little bit different. One of the things that is probably the most optimal deviation from that or exploitation of that is something like Travis Kelsey T. Higgins. That's easy to visualize. But again, if we assume, and the starting point here is the assumption that Outside of Tier 1 players, there is significant overlap in ADP in the first three rounds. I want to exploit that in my favor. The second area of drafts that we can utilize this mentality is the final three to five rounds. What we see is the same players are drafted in those rounds what, 90 to 95% frequency? Is the median projection of an 18th round player right now vastly different from a 15th round player? Not really. Median projections are going to be very, very similar on those players. Is it an exploitation to draft a 17th or 18th round player in the 15th round? Yeah, that is a move away from optimal. Could that generate more expected value than the loss from the exploit itself? Yeah. What about the players that are drafted at a 5 to 10% frequency every draft? Your, we use running backs. Your, um, your Malik Davises, your Joshua Kellys, um, your Pierres in New England. Are their median projections vastly different from a guy like Tajay Spears going in the 14th, 15th round? No, their median projections are fairly similar. So why are those three being drafted at a 20% frequency when Tajay is being drafted in every draft? It shouldn't be that. I can tell you that much. So utilizing the first three-ish rounds and the last three-ish rounds to vary our player combinations. And we say player combinations. It's not apples to apples of what player combinations would be in DFS. Because in DFS, we have nine roster spots. We have nine players to fill those roster spots. Every player is contributing. In best ball, we have 18 or 20 or 28 in some places to fill eight roster spots or nine or 10, depending on the format and where you're drafting. So yes, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but when we talk about player combinations, it is through the lens of single week player combinations, because that is what this contest turns into when it matters the most. Weeks 15, week 16, week 17, primarily week 17. That is where unique player combinations matter the most. And the best areas in the draft 
to generate those unique player combinations are the first three rounds and the last three rounds. So that was our quick down and dirty on practical psychology, how we can utilize human psychology in our favor to generate these exploitations on field tendencies and build leverage in order to generate more expected value than is lost from the exploit or the deviation itself. And with that, I am Hilo. This was First Mover. We'll get out of here with a quick word from the Podfather. Hey, I want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in. It's important to me that all of our media be free. This is only possible because of you allowing a true independent sports media enterprise to thrive unlike any other in the business. So please subscribe to the All In Package to continue to make all this possible to ensure that all of our stats, information, data, content is available to you, especially you, the people that get the site and get the show.